Hi everyone. Well, it's that time of year again. It's time for the Barnes & Noble Criterion Half Price Sale. And this my, has been a tradition of mine uh, as the sale is starting today as I'm recording it. In fact, I just got back from Barnes & Noble on uh, 9.30, June 30th. Uh, the sale started. I believe it's going until July 28th. So I was there about 9 o'clock this morning, first day of the sale. Picked up three items. I still have a couple more to go that new releases that will be coming out in July but I picked up the 4k of double indemnity uh, this is really a stacked um, uh, edition uh, lots of great supplements in it including a conversation between Eddie Muller and uh, image and Sarah Smith that I'm really looking forward to I've seen this film many many times I saw a pristine print once in the uh, uh, film society um, a whole lot of years ago, but uh, I'm, I'm uh, really uh, that. And this, I believe, is is this 4K uh, edition came out, I believe, uh, uh, last year or sometime. But these next two are recent releases, and one is Ruben Ostland's Triangle of Sadness. And I was hedging whether to get this. I saw this film in the movies, and and I was very. <laughs> I was uh, I was very uh, perplexed. I don't know if the word is perplexed, but it was it is full of unexpected things, let us say. So, and I mentioned it a little bit on a video uh, last year, but I really want to do a uh, a full length, uh, more in depth uh, review of uh, Triangle of Sadness, and I'm interested in seeing how it looks in the 4K. And this is in 4K. I think there is a 4K in um, in addition to this in, in Europe, but uh, I've, this is another film, an all-time favorite that I've seen many, many times, the Servant Joseph Losey film with uh, Dirk Bogart and James Fox. Uh, it does have some pretty, it has some extras on it that are pretty good, but this is a film I definitely uh, want to make, I'm very eager to make a video on. So as far as recommendations, I'm, I've got 10 here. And these 10 are all from, the, or eight of the 10 are from the last sale, the last Barnes and Noble sale, which was like seven months ago. And then I've got two others that, uh, two other Criterion releases, older releases, but I just bought earlier this year. I've done videos on, on all these, um, on all these titles, and I've done quite a few Criterion um, recommendation videos before, and I have a playlist and. Of those videos so if anybody's interested in even more recommendations uh, uh, you can uh, you, you can click on that playlist so this this came out Malcolm X came out in the um, in during the last sale I think last November and this is uh, this is a rather sprawling biopic uh, it's kind of traditional in that sense uh, directed by Spike Lee with an absolutely great performance by Denzel Washington a very controversial figure in his lifetime. I remember him well from uh, the 1960s. He was on television a lot. He, he was the black leader, uh, civil rights leader that uh, scared white people. Martin Luther King was uh, uh, was was more palatable to the white people at the, at that time, um, and uh, he was he 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 could seem kind of scary. The last 30 minutes of this film, I think, is the best passage of filmmaking that Spike Lee ever did, which is when uh, when Malcolm X goes back to or goes to uh, Mecca on a uh, on his Hajj, and uh, his his eyes are open. He has transformed his view of of other people, his view of himself, his view of the nation of Islam, which he was at one one point the main spokesman. Uh, so he transforms his life, finds a great deal of happiness with him, even while he knows that by doing so, he's putting his life on the line. Also, from the end of last year, is Jane Campion's The Power of the Dog. Uh, this is a, a Western uh, set in the early 1900s, actually filmed in New Zealand, but it looks fantastic. Uh, it stars uh, Benedict Cumberbatch, Kirsten Dunst, uh, Jesse Plemons, and a uh, actor by the name of Cody Smith McVie, who's really great. And once again, the ending, the last 20, 30 minutes of this film is just, just superb. As was Spike Lee, I think this is the greatest passage of filmmaking that Jane Campion uh, ever did. Um, 
it's a, it's a it's a, a passage I think you're going to find very very haunting and uh, one that I'm going back to see more than once afterwards. Um, and uh, it's a, it's a, it's a western, but it's set in the transitional phase between the old west and the values of the old west uh, are fading away, and uh, moderate modernity and uh, automobiles are are uh, are on the horizon. And then we have, I think this was the first release of, um, by Criterion in 2023, and this is The Adventures of Baron Munchausen, directed by Terry Gillum. John, ne John Neville <clears throat> uh, playing, uh, playing the Baron, uh, some uh, great uh, supporting roles here, Michael Palin from uh, Monty Python, and, and a very funny turn by Robin Williams as well. This is, was, was a really, off the charts imaginative fantastical movie uh terry gillum kind of got carried away a little bit i think he even says so in his commentary um, and the movie went way over budget uh it was a disaster at the box office uh, gillum thought he would never make another movie but he does indeed because i've got another terry gillum in this uh, in this pile of criterion blu-rays and uh, it was a very troubled production there's an interview with Sarah Polly here, a uh, recent interview where she describes the, uh, the, uh, how uh, dangerous uh, these uh, scenes that uh, were being filmed by Terry Gillen, where she was she, not having a double, she had to participate and she was scared to death. And she was only, I think, around 10 years old when she appeared as uh, one of the uh, companions of, of Baron Munchausen. 1934, Hollywood, uh, the, the Days of the Dream Factory, and Claudette Colbert, Louise Beavers, Imitation of Life. This is the black and white version. Uh, it, it has been overshadowed by the 1959 version that Douglas Sirk uh, directed in 1959, so 25 years later. Uh, this is ostensibly the the star of this film is is quite a cold bear it's her story her her rags to riches story but it's really the story of louise beavers her housekeeper her uh her uh, partner in in her rise to riches but it's the story of louise beavers uh, uh, very troubled relationship with her daughter who um, who is able to pass and wants to pass and uh, it's a, a Fanny Hearst story, so it's a tearjerker. And um, even though John Stoll is a director that's been sort of overshadowed, overlooked through the years, and uh, even though I prefer the Cirque ver version, Stoll's version is very, very good. Another 2021 uh, movie, uh, this is Bergman Island with Vicki Kreps and, and Tim Roth, <clears throat> and that is indeed set on uh, Bergman's Island of Faro. Uh, and they are they are fellow filmmakers, sort of uh, uh, sort of a uh, uh, autobiographical. As, as the director Mia Hansen Love was a partner of Oliver Asias in, in these years, and they go to Bergman's Island to they're right they're working on their individual screenplays, um, hoping to get some some uh, inspiration from uh, living in. Uh, living on uh, the Bergman complex. And in fact, they, they sleep in the bed where uh, Lee Volman and Erlan Josephson <clears throat> uh, sleep during the filming of uh, scenes, scenes from a Marriage, which is a 1973 movie that uh, I'm, I'm watching. I've seen the theatrical version. I'm watching the, uh, the five, six uh, episode uh, uh, television version right now. But the, there, there's actually two movies here. There is the the uh, one set in contemporary times uh, about this couple, very cool, very unemotional, uh, emotionally detached. And then we have scenes from Mickey Krebs' screenplay. Uh, and this is much more Bourbon-esque, the pain of life, the pain of relationships. It's a really interesting uh, contrast. Not only that, if you're a Bourbon fan, this is sort of, as well as these two stories, it's sort of a, um, a travelogue of Pharaoh, and you get to see some of the locations where some of uh, Ingmar Bergman, who lived on the island of Pharaoh the last 40 years of his life, 
uh, where he filmed some of his most famous films. And now, <clears throat> back to the golden age of Hollywood, Mildred Pierce, uh, directed by Michael Curtiz, Joan Crawford's uh, Academy Award winning performance and based on a novel by James M. Cain. I read the novel right before I saw, re-watched the movie. I would have to say this is much better than the novel. <laughs> and um, I think Double Indemnity is the same way with, uh, with, the, Cain, with the Cain novel. Uh, and maybe even The Postman always rings twice. Hollywood sometimes uh, can actually improve a book. Um, and this is famous, this basic storyline is Joan Crawford playing the mother who dotes and uh, spoils her daughter who is totally undeserving of that mother's love. And uh, one of the great scenes in Hollywood history, who, who would know, would be Anne Blythe and, and Joan Crawford on the staircase where they confront each other and Joan Crawford gets to see who her daughter really is. It's a, it's a, this is a beautiful, beautiful 4K. This is a 4K release. Now this next film, this is, this is a film I'm going to recommend, but not to everybody. If you're a very adventurous film, uh, film lover and you like to uh, see very unusual films, you, the European art film uh, writ large here, uh, these are actually two films, India Song and Baxter, Vera Baxter from uh, Marguerite Duras. Uh, in, the, in the U.S., Marguerite Duras is probably most well known for her fiction, but she did direct 17 movies, and she also wrote the screenplay for Alan Renee's Hiroshima Mon Amour. These are really unusual films, and uh, I would even say somewhat perverse. India's Song is, is largely considered her best film. But it's a film, and it's a film with movie stars in it, Delphine Seerig and Michael Lan Lonsdale. But in India Song, none of the characters speak. So we see them sort of wandering and sleepwalking through a mansion. And we hear, on the soundtrack, we hear a conversation, a commentary, uh, describing who these characters are, what might have, might not have, have happened to them. <laughs> uh, it's a puzzle, you have to sort of work it out, you have to pay attention. In Baxter Vera Baxter also has, stars Delphine Seerig, but she talks in this one. But it's nevertheless as a, as a puzzle as, as the first film. Uh, I would I would I really enjoy these. I, I I don't know what it is. It's 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 sometimes good to get away from the formulas, the concepts of, of uh, commercial cinema, and see an artist who is really committed to telling the stories, telling using narrative and. Uh, cinematically in, in unusual ways. From 1979, Chilly Scenes of Winter. This is one of my all-time favorite films. When this came out, it was originally released as Head Over Heels, and it was advertised as rom-com, uh, but it's not a rom-com. <laughs> I mean, it is a romantic comedy, tr drama, tragedy, it's hard to describe. It's based on a, a very good novel by Ann Beatty. Uh, John Hurd, Mary Beth Hurt. Uh, John Hurd falls madly in love with uh, Mary Beth Hurd. Like a, he is like struck by a bolt of lightning. And I think in 1979, I think I would have been too. <laughs> Were I to encounter Mary Beth Hurd at my workplace, uh, they have a short period of time together. <clears throat> Two months, I believe. It's, this is described in the beginning of the film, and then Mary Beth Hurt goes back to the man that she has been living with and taking care of, her, of his, daughter, his young daughter. But John Hurt, the rest of the movie, he has to get her back. His life simply cannot go on unless he gets her back in the, in the snowy atmosphere of Salt Lake City. It's a, it's a, one, it's a very, very unusual film, and it's uh, anybody who's ever fallen in love and it didn't work out, <laughs> This would probably be a movie you might want to see, depending how long ago that trauma had happened <laughs> in your life. Now, here's the other Terry Gillum 4K of uh, The Fisher King from 1991. Um, <clears throat> and stars you know, two biggies and Jeff Bridges and uh, Robin Williams, both very, very good. Uh, but it was Mercedes Rule who wins the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress. Uh, Amanda Plummer is also in here. Uh, very good performance. Terry Gillum is more grounded here, and he really tried, as you learn in the supplements in this film, 
of, of this release that Terry Gillum really wanted to to uh, uh, sort of restrain his his wild imagination and make a, a more traditional kind of film, uh, and he really did succeed here. And, and this not to say this film is unimaginative; it certainly is. But the performances. Uh, the two main leads uh, are suffering from a horrible, uh, traumatic experience. They don't. One of them doesn't real doesn't know that the other one is is responsible for that trauma, and uh, so it's something that um, it, it's a movie I, again very unusual. Now here we this is the second 4K from Terry Gillum, and we have Time Bandits is also at it. I hadn't gotten that yet. When I went to the store, they had the Blu-ray, but they didn't have the 4K um, <clears throat> of Time Bandit. So three Terry Gillum films. We still don't have Akira Kurosawa in 4K on Criterion. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> and uh, and we don't have, uh, so there's no Seven Samurai. There's no Ala Ventura. There's no uh, Michelangelo Antonioni. These were staple films from the early days of, of Criterion. Um, not to denigrate Terry Gillen, because this is this is a, a very estimable film and it looks fantastic uh, in Dolby Vision. And then I have two films that I bought earlier this year uh, as part of my 50 years ago, 1973 uh, year-long series of uh, looking back at, at the films uh, from 50 years ago. And I picked up Badlands, and this is Terrence Malick's uh, debut film and uh, starring Martin Sheen and Sissy Spacek and uh, it's one of the, I was really astonished by it. I saw it when it came out in, uh, in 1973. I didn't much like it. I didn't understand it. Uh, I thought it was very visually beautiful, which it certainly is, as befitting a Terrence Malick film. I, I was really overwhelmed by it when I rewatched it uh, as part of this series of uh, 1973 movies. It's, it's about, it's based on a, a true life crime uh, spree by uh, uh, Charles Starkweather in the late 1950s. I, I vaguely remember it because the whole country was sort of enwrapped in, in, in with this, um, with his escapade that lasted, I think, somewhere like eight or nine days, and he was killing people along the way, seemingly for no reason. Um, so, uh, and the, the, the movie does stick pretty closely to the Starkweather story. It's a little bit different. It's, it's, it, it is about the cult of celebrity, the emptiness of the wide open spaces in the American plains, uh, celebrity culture, gun culture, and I think infused uh, more than a little bit by it, the era in which it was made, which was the moral uh, confusion um, uh, as a result of, of the Vietnam War. And last but hardly least is Francois Truffaut's Day for Night. I just finished a, uh, a series of four videos where I talk about the Francois Truffaut collection that Ken Lorber uh, put out. They had four movies in that collection. Uh, they also released three single releases. I talked Mississippi Mermaid I talked about last year, and I, uh, this year I talked about um, A Story of Adele H. And, um, the Bright War Black, plus the, the other four films, plus this. So it's been a year in Francois Truffaut where I've been able to uh, fall in love with Truffaut and his movies again. Uh, he was a, he was probably the most, in his own lifetime, he was probably the most popular of all the French New Wave directors. Now I'm very, very, very fond of the French New Wave and the, the whole cinematic, the cinephilia of, uh, of those directors that came out of that movie, uh, that, that, that movement. Uh, most of them were, were, were they, all of them were critics. They wrote books. They watched movies over and over and over and over again. So this is Truffaut's, uh, this is Truffaut's uh, story of, of making a movie, a low-budget movie. It's all about the collaborative nature of filmmaking, uh, all the things that can go wrong, the unforeseen circumstances. They have to uh, improvise on the job. Uh, the movie has old time stars on the decline. The movie also, the movie that, that Francois Truffaut, who's acting in this movie as a director, uh, so he has some old time movie stars. And he also has a big uh, star of this era, which was Jackie, uh, Jacqueline Bissett at her, uh, at her peak. Um, and 
So it's a love letter to cinema that only really Francois Truffaut could uh, could provide. I'm also going to just quickly recommend a, a box set from two and a half years ago. Uh, there is a new box set, Pasolini 101, that that's came out in June, so you can purchase that to $125 at, at half price. Two and a half years ago, there was a box set of Federico Fellini films, um, and uh, which I purchased at the time. I haven't talked much about this set, uh, but I, I'm doing a, a, a video on uh, on Amarcord, which was Fellini's 1973 movie, and I've suddenly got the urge to go back through these films. Now, Pasolini, I've only seen a couple of Pasolini films, but I didn't get along too well with them, and I'm not, I'm not ready to spend $125. Uh, but if you've not gotten this Fellini set, this is really a beautiful, beautiful set, and uh, it was a controversial packaging at the time, sort of a laser disc uh, LP kind of, uh, kind of a, a, a package. Uh, it's got a couple of great books on essays. I particularly like the, uh, the uh, artwork on here on the uh, where the discs are stored, which is sort of like a laser disc or an LP and you know you got Anita Eckberg, Marcello Mastriani and on the other cover we have Julia Messina, we have Anthony Quinn, Carol Estrada. Um, so I've never been a big fan of, uh, of, of, of Fellini, but uh, I don't know. Some, it's, it's, it's for some reason, I, I really want to, I really want to go back and, uh, so, and and revisit them again. So, if you want to spend your hundred twenty-five on Pasolini, you haven't gotten the Fellini set yet. Um, uh, my recommendation would be Fellini, but Pasolini, you know, obviously he does have his fans as well. He might not be in, in ranked as highly in. Uh, movie history as, as Fellini, however. So um, I have, a, I, as I mentioned earlier, I have a playlist for other videos, recommendation videos. Uh, and for the month of July, I'm going to talk about all criterion. So the criterion that I've picked up in this sale, I'll, uh, the three that I've just sh showed at the beginning and whatever else I pick up, I'm going to intersperse them with a short series of films I'm calling Criterion Classics. I'm not a I'm, I'm not much attuned to talking about classics because what the heck can I add to everything that's been said about them, but I'm in the mood to do that. So I'm going to intersperse maybe five or six classic movies uh, into the month of July is to be adjacent to the Barnes & Noble sale and really a celebration of, uh, of uh, Criterion and uh, of movies in general. Okay, thanks a lot for everybody who managed to listen. Comments are welcome. I'd love to hear what you guys are picking up during the sale. Take care.